Cathedral at Gloucester. Surely the most vivid of our English monuments to the Middle Ages as a period of development, a progression. Could anyone, however dull of imagination, walk from the Norman nave into the 14th century choir, the very birthplace of the perpendicular style, without experiencing quite dramatically a sense of passing from a heavy, primitive culture to one of subtlety and elegance. And it happens at a step, without any softening transition. I can think of few architectural juxtapositions as revelational as this one, and none that so arrestingly insists on the plurality of the Middle Ages. Of course, it's all the monkish and deluded past, Voltaire was it, but what a difference. In the Norman conception of church building, and Gloucester's is well-finished Norman, there's still the gloom and mystery of the cave. But in the perpendicular, the magic works through human skill, ingenuity, and imagination, through the sheer virtuosity of the achievement. And where more so than in this astonishing choir? The light upward leap of 92 feet, the intricacy of the vault, the vastness of the Cressy window. It's all here. And yet, so far as is known, the only trial run the building team had had was in the south transept. Later came the cloisters, the tower, and the lady chapel, all perpendicular. The tower of cool grey stone without any reddishness is surely the most finely wrought of all such towers. No wonder that Gloucester Cathedral has been named among the six most beautiful buildings in Europe. Monkish, did I say? Most certainly. There was no bishop here, and therefore no cathedral, until after the monastery was suppressed in 1540, when a new diocese was created from a part of the immense Worcester Diocese. Before that, this building was a Benedictine Abbey church. The monastery was substantially, the church alone tells us that, though hardly as important as the one at Worcester. Around 1300, under an abbot who knew the value of the woolen trade, there were some 10,000 sheep on the monastic manors, clearly a large-scale enterprise. And yet there were repeated financial crises, partly perhaps because of a succession of disastrous fires. True, one reads of fires in all monastic histories, but Gloucester seems to have been particularly hard hit. In 1242, the church was made less vulnerable by giving the nave its stone-ribbed vault. Previously, the roof was of timber and thatch. But fires continued to work havoc among the domestic buildings. Perhaps, too, the building ambitions of some of the later abbots were simply beyond their means. From this point of view, the events that followed the murder of the deposed Edward II at Barclay Castle, some 15 miles to the southwest, in 1327, are of special interest. It appears that three other monasteries, fearful of Queen Isabella and her lover, Roger Mortimer, refused to accept Edward's body. And yet the Abbot of Gloucester not only accepted, but made a great show calculated move, was it? A piece of opportunism? I think the answer has to be yes. For the next thing we hear of is Edward depicted as a holy martyr and pilgrims flocking to his tomb. For about 40 years, Gloucester cornered the pilgrim trade of the whole of the West Midlands. This certainly transformed the finances. Indeed, it built the perpendicular choir. Yes, that miraculous birth of the ultimate phase in English Gothic was made possible by a cynical fostering of popular superstition. Are we to say, then, that the end justified the means, that the exaltation of later generations has outweighed the exploitation of pilgrims? I throw these questions to the moralist aesthetes and turn now to the music. Gloucester in the Middle Ages wasn't the great musical centre that Worcester was, nor did it have any notable musicians in the later 16th century. The first recorded organist is one Robert Litchfield, who seems to have been appointed in the early 1560s, 
but he's a shadowy figure, and so are his successors. Not until John Oakover, or Oka as he's sometimes called, does a real composer appear, and he was at Gloucester for only four years before the triumph of the parliamentary cause put an end to choral services, in 1644, that is. The city of Gloucester was as staunchly for Parliament as Worcester was for the king, and we learn that Oakover himself was very well affected to the Parliament having been in arms for them, which may explain his departure from Gloucester at the Restoration. He wrote fantasies for viols and other secular music, as well as church music. In this a cappella setting of words from the Collect for the 21st Sunday after Trinity, grant we beseech thee, he gives prominence to the use of false relations, very much in the old tradition. There are four parts. Another figure one would like to know more of is Daniel Rosengrave, a pupil of both Purcell and Blow. He's mentioned today, if at all, as the father of Thomas Rosengrave, the first organist of St George's, Hanover Square, and a musician noted for his independence. Daniel came to Gloucester as organist in 1679, quite early in his career. Almost at once, he was admonished for beating and wounding John Payne, one of the singing men. He stayed for about two years, going on to Winchester, Salisbury, and finally Dublin. Here now, to a chant by Rosengrave is Psalm 70, which appropriately, or ironically perhaps, includes the words, 
let them be turned backward and put to confusion that wish me evil. Gloucester has long been celebrated for its bells. I don't mean simply the cathedral bells, though these too are justly celebrated. They include a, a medieval signum or great bell, the only one of its kind to survive in England. There was a bell foundry at Gloucester, a noted one, as early as the reign of Edward III. In 1345, for example, a master John of Gloucester cast four new bells for the cathedral at Ely. Of the later bell founders, Abraham Rudhall from around 1700 was perhaps the most important. Any keen campanologist will tell you a lot about Rudhall and the Gloucester foundries. A daughter of Rudhall became the wife of William Hine, who was the cathedral organist for about 20 years down to 1730. Indeed, Hine or Hind appears in the cathedral records as early as 1707. For several years, it seems, he was in double harness with his predecessor, Stephen Jeffreys, who was notorious for his tippling, absenteeism, and generally unpredictable behaviour. On one occasion, Jeffreys had them dancing in the aisles, quite literally, and was reproved by the dean and chapter for playing on the organ a common ballad. Dear me. Hine, a pupil of Jeremiah Clark, incidentally, was a much more dependable character. Rather dull, too, if the morning service known as Hall and Hine in E-flat is any guide. Far better to represent him with this engaging little organ piece written for the flute stop.
It was during Hines years at Gloucester that the Harris organ, built in 1665, was moved from the side of the choir to its present position on the choir screen. Musically, of course, there's much to be said for this central position, but is it worth the sacrifice of so splendid a vista? I think of Exeter and of King's College Chapel, Cambridge, others too. It seems to be a strictly Anglican aberration, this blocking of the larger vista. However, more of the organ later. Our next item will be sung in the chapter house, presumably to avoid dancing in the aisles, if only by the producer and myself. It could be called a common ballad. And I can imagine Stephen Jeffreys, where he lies in the cloisters, giving an appreciative twitch. This is a song written in about 1780 by John Stafford Smith, a former chorister of Gloucester, where his father, Martin Smith, was organist for some 40 years. It's the song of the sons of Anacreon, pledged to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's vine. No wonder it became so popular. In America, we are told the tune was adapted to many different words, and it ended up as the American national anthem. Here, then, is the original Anacreontic song, not quite as sung in the 1780s at the Crown and Anchor Tavern in the Strand, but in an arrangement by John Sanders, who directs the lay clerks from the harpsichord. In a hem where he sat in full feet, a few sons of harmony sent a petition that he their inspirer and patron would be. When this answer arrived from the jolly old priest, voice fiddle and flute no longer be mute, I lend you my name and inspire you to. And besides, I'll instruct you like me to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's wine. And besides, I'll instruct you like me to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's wine. The news through Olympus immediately when no thunder pretended to give himself theirs, if these mortals are suffered their scheme to pursue, the devils of God as would stay up upstairs. Up already they cry in transports of joy, away to the sons of a Hacklion we'll fly, and there we good fellows we learn to Support what so happily be planned. You the sanction of gods and the fiat of Jove. While thus we agree, a toast let it be. May our club carish have united and free. And long may the sons of Anacreon enjoy the murder of Venus with Bacchus's wine. And long may the sons of Anacreon entwine the virtual of Venus with Bacchus's vine. Back now into the 14th century choir, and forward nearly a hundred years to Samuel Sebastian Wesley, who is easily the most notable creative musician to have been organist and master of the choristers at Gloucester. 
a national figure, Wesley did much to raise the standard of Victorian cathedral music, both in performance and in the music itself. He was a vigorous protagonist of the Bach revival and introduced the St. Matthew Passion to the Three Choirs Festival, that was at Gloucester in 1871. He spent the last 11 years of his life at Gloucester, having previously been organist at Hereford, we'll be meeting him again there, at Exeter, Leeds Parish Church, and Winchester. We're going to hear two of Wesley's compositions. First, an anthem for Christmas, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, a setting of biblical words, some of which are very familiar.
and now an organ piece by Wesley, an air composed for the bells of Holsworthy Church in South Devon, with variations. This is very much a period piece, and its gentle musing is far removed from the grander Wesley. The air with variations, Holsworthy Bells.
Wesley, in his last years, he died in 1876, is said to have neglected the training of the choristers, which he delegated to one of the lay clerks, with the inevitable result. Nonetheless, he marks the beginning of a decided upturn in Gloucester's music. His immediate successors, C. H. Lloyd and Lee Williams, were men of both ability and dedication. And then at the end of the century, in the same year as Ivor Atkins was appointed at Worcester, came Herbert Brewer. From all accounts, Brewer was as fine an organist as Wesley and a much better conductor. We've chosen to remember him through two of his pupil assistants, one of them being the next Gloucester organist, Herbert Sumption, more of him in a moment, and the other, the composer, Herbert Howells. Although a Londoner by adoption, Howells has always had a keen awareness of his Gloucestershire roots, and many of his most deeply formative musical experiences are associated with Gloucester Cathedral. For example, the first performance of Vaughan Williams's Talis Fantasia at the Three Choirs Festival of 1910, which he remembers vividly. That particular experience may well be reflected in the opening phrase, it's the basic musical idea, of the Magnificat that Howells wrote for this cathedral in 1946. Among the music chosen for this program, here, surely, are the qualities of texture most at one with the radiance of Gloucester's perpendicular. It's largely a matter of finely drawn melodic lines and luminous dissonances. The Gloucester Magnificat by Herbert Howell.
In this century, the continuity at Gloucester, musically speaking, has been unusually marked. Just as Brewer was succeeded by a former pupil, so was Sumption by one of his former sub-organists. That was in 1967, when John Sanders returned after four years as organist at Chester. Among his achievements is the extensively rebuilt organ, the brightness and incisiveness of which is well displayed in Sanders's own Festival Te Deum, a lively, Waltonish, Britonish setting, nicely judged for a resonant acoustic. This will be followed by a plain song recession.
Gloucester Cathedral, Reflections in Words and Music, was presented by the late Hugh Ottaway. The opening and closing plain chant, Ece Tabernaculum Dei Cum Hominibus, was taken from the Gloucester Antiphona. The other music heard in programme order was Grant We Beseech Thee by John Oakover, verses from Psalm 70 to a chant by Daniel Rosengrave, a flute piece by William Hine, played on the organ by John Sanders, the Anacreontic Hymn by John Stafford Smith, and the anthem Blessed Be the Lord God of Israel by Samuel Sebastian Wesley. Then we heard another work by Wesley, played on the organ by John Sanders, called Holesworthy Bells. This was followed by Herbert Howells's Gloucester Magnificat and a carol by Herbert Sumption. The programme ended with the Festival Te Deum by John Sanders. It was recorded in 1977 with the Gloucester Cathedral Choir, accompanied by the assistant organist Andrew Millington, and was directed by John Sanders and produced by Gillian White of BBC Birmingham. <laughs>